All right. So uh, today we will start with some uh, random experiments. Consider some very simple random experiments, and then uh, think about the traditional probability theory and what are the issues with the traditional uh, theoretical framework. So let's first consider some simple random experiments. And in particular, we will consider a discrete, uh, discrete random, random experiment and a continuous one. Okay, now the simplest example that we, we have uh, learned about in all the probability courses is probably the single row of a die. So you roll a die and you ex expect it to get six, possibly six different outcomes. So when we consider uh, these random experiments, the first thing that we are interested in is the, all the possible outcomes. Right? Before we talk about probability, we need to understand what are all the possibilities about this experiment of interest. So let's denote this, let, we can define a set of outcomes. which basically includes every possible outcome. So in this particular example, we know that by rolling a die, we can get um, six different outcomes. So we, let me use, so let's denote all the, the set of all possible outcomes as the set omega. So we will use these notations throughout this course. Okay. Omega is the set of all the possible outcomes. And for this particular example, we know it is one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay. So these are the, all the poss possible outcomes that we can, uh, we can get. And then uh, once, we, once we know this, we can start here to consider some, um, some events of interest. Now, for example, now the first event A can be uh, the following event. So let's consider the event such that the outcome that we observe is divisible by three. Okay, this is an event, right? You roll a dice, you roll a die and you consider the event. Okay, the outcome, the number that we observe is divisible by three. This is one event. And mathematically, we can we can write it in a um, compact and mathematical way. So if you consider all the possible outcomes, we know that there are only two possibilities, two outcomes that are divisible by three. So essentially, this A is the set three and six. Okay. So you can see that this event is essentially a subset a subset of this omega set. Okay. And we can also consider uh, the other different events. For example, we can say, okay, consider this event B, which, mean, which says that the outcome is a prime number. And then you look at all the the set of all the outcomes. You you can you can uh, find out that this B mathematically it means you just uh, consider each outcome and check whether or not it is a prime number. So one is not prime number by definition. So we start from two. 
okay, two is a prime number, three is prime number, four is not because it has a factor of two. Five is a prime number, six is not, six is divisible by two, okay? So these are the, uh, all the possible outcomes that are prime numbers. And we can see that uh, for this event B, it is also a subset. Mathematically, it is also a subset of the set of all the outcomes. Okay. So both A and B, they belong to um, this omega set. We are a subset of omega. Okay. Now, later on, uh, when we formally define the events, in probability theory, um, we will see that mathematically events are defined as subsets of all the possible outcomes. Okay, so everything is a set. The omega, uh, which is uh, which contains all the possible outcomes, this is the biggest set that we can see. And the event that we uh, we consider in the probability theory are always referring to subsets of this omega set. Okay, so the event is a subset. So this is a discrete example. Uh, basically discrete means that this omega, the set of all the outcome, this omega set contains discrete elements. So everything is discrete. But in reality, in many cases, we are dealing with uh, continuous numbers or continuous uh, scenarios. So let's consider a continuous example. I you have a question? Uh, yes, later on we will we will talk about that. Yeah, every as long as the elements in this all the elements in this set belongs to omega, then A or B is called a subset. Yeah. A subset means that every element in that set must belong to omega. So if you draw a picture, this could be omega and A and B, they are subsets. They're subsets. So now let's con let's consider a continuous example, which will cause some problems later on uh, for the traditional probability theory. So continuous experiment, and here let's consider a very simple uh, experiment. So consider a bus that may arrive between 9 and 9 to 10 a.m. Okay. So between this, uh, within this period of time, the, uh, the bus can arrive, maybe uniformly at random, maybe following other distributions, but let's just consider this experiment. Uh, and we can also define, but so, so the first question is, what are the possible outcomes of this random experiment? Okay. So any ideas? Yes, so the bus can arrive at any time between nine and 10. So all the outcomes is the set of all the time, time uh, between nine and 10. So let's, let's denote omega as the bus arrival time, wait, bus arrival time. which can be random uh, between nine, nine and 10. So the outcome, the set of all possible outcome is the set. Well, this bus arrival time is, you know, 
between nine and uh, nine and ten. Uh, so I will just write it nine to ten. Right. So this is the set of all the outcomes. And because the time is continuous, like between nine and ten, these are two real numbers. You can we can have uh, infinitely many possible outcomes. So this is infinite. And then we can consider, uh, once we have this set of all the possible outcomes, we can start it to consider some, some events. For example, a event C could be uh, bus arrives at 9.15 a.m. And this event, uh, we can write it in a mathematical form. So this C is basically, now the bus arrival time is exactly 9.15. Now bus arrival is omega. So this exactly means omega equals to uh, 9.15. And another event D could be I can catch the bus if I arrive at 9.30. So if I arrive, if I arrive at the bus stop at 9.30 a.m., then I can catch the bus. So how can we translate, so the question is, how can we translate this event into a mathematical form about omega, about the bus arrival time? So what, what are the bus arrival times that can, so that I can catch the bus if I, if I arrive at my city? From so if you want to catch the bus, then the bus must be arrived after your arrival, right? So if I arrive at nine thirty, then well, the bus has to arrive after me in order for me to catch up the bus. So this literally means omega, the bus arrival time must be uh, after nine thirty. It's nine thirty to 10 a.m. So it's an interval instead of uh, a point in the event C. And we can we can visualize uh, these events. So if we consider this time interval. And event C is basically a, a point. Well, event D is a interval between Nine thirty uh, and ten. And again, you can see from this example that these events, both C and D, they are a subsets of omega. Okay? So that's why we call them events. Okay? So mathematically, events means subsets, proper subsets of the omega omega set. So C is a single point, is a single uh, point below, uh, inside or belonging to omega. Well, D is an interval, and this subset of interval also uh, belongs to omega set. So both are events. So this is how we define events, how we describe events mathematically uh, in probability theory. We first First, you need to understand your uh, experiment of interest and figure out the, all the possible outcomes. 
and they form an uh, omega set. And then any subset is called an event. Any subset is called an event. Okay, uh, any questions for now? Okay. So now we can, uh, let's talk about classic uh, traditional probability theory. So how do we deal with probabilities in traditional probability theory uh, for these two examples? Well, in, in the traditional probability theory, we consider uh, these two a pair of uh, space and the probability probability loss. So omega is the set of all the outcomes that we talked about uh, before. And this P is a function, the probability mass function that assigns probability mass to each outcome in the omega set. So this is how we deal with probabilities in the traditional way. So this omega is the set of all outcomes that we have talked about this before. And this P is a probability mass function that uh, assigns probabilities to every outcome in the omega set. Okay. So for every outcome in that omega set, we assign some probabilities. And we know that in, uh, in order to make it a proper probability, they, uh, so first of all, each probability mass must be between zero and one, and their summation must sum up to one. So this is, uh, if you take 35, 30, right, you, you are very familiar with this um, setup. And now let's apply Let's try, let's try to apply this uh, probability theory to understand the, the previous two random experiments. Let's consider a single row of a fair time. A fail means that every outcome may appear with equal probability, equally likely to, to be observed. So basically this fail, this keyword already implies, tells us that the probability that we observe are zero sorry, one, the first outcome is one. The probability that we, we observe a one equals to probability we observe two and equals to probability up to observing a six. And it is a failed dive. So every single observation may happen with probability one or six. Six outcomes, every outcome has probability one or six. So this is a translation of this sentence, the single rule of a fail that this fail means, it essentially means this uh, probability mass function, implies this probability mass function. <clears throat> so you can see that uh, this is how we deal with probabilities in the traditional way. We assign uh, probability mass to every single outcome in the omega set and then make sure they sum up to one. 
And once we have this, we can calculate the probabilities of the events. For example, uh, we can consider the probability of event A. Well, go, go to the previous example, event, this event A, which means the outcome is divisible by three. Okay? So A has two, these two elements. So when we calculate the probability of this event, it's basically the probability of, of observing uh, either three or six. Okay. And in the traditional probability theory, we calculate the probability of the event by summing up the probability mass of all the outcomes in that event. So this event A has two outcomes, three and six. So we sum up their individual uh, probability mass. And because it's a fair die, so we know it's 206. So that's the probability of A, right? And similarly, uh, probability of B, uh, well, B means the outcome's a prime number is essentially probability of two, three, five, this set. And again, we do the we do it in, in the same way. We just count, we just sum up all the probability mass associated with each outcome in this event. So because it's a failed die, so we know that it is three or six, three outcomes. They are they are, <clears throat> all of them happen equally likely. Okay. Right, so this seems very, very intuitive and very, very simple. Uh, exactly matches other issues. So there's no problem with uh, with this uh, with this example. But there, are, but the issues will arrive will arise when we consider continuous uh, experiments. So let's let's now consider that fast waiting example. So still considering that uh, fast arrival example, uh, we assume the bus arrives between nine and 10 equally likely. Okay, so it is similar to a, to a rolling, uh, <clears throat> rolling a fair die, but everything, every possibility may occur equally likely. So we know the omega, the omega uh, set is the, is a continuous interval, but right? it's the set of all the bus arrival times between uh, nine and 10. So following the traditional probability theory, uh, we need to assign probability mass to every single outcome, um, to every possible outcome. And because we, we assume that the bus will arrive at any time point equally likely. Which means P omega one will equal to P omega two for any. For any two different arrival time uh, in the omega set. Right? So the equally likely means that the probability of the uh, of the bus arriving at omega one at time omega one is equal to the probability of, of the bus arrives at time omega two. So, so it's equally likely. But then the issue is that in the previous example, right, we also have this equally likely uh, assumption condition. And in, in this example, because we have only six outcomes, right, six is a finite number. So we can calculate, we know that the probability of each outcome is one over six. So this is computable. But in this case, 
although every outcome is equally likely, but we have infinitely many outcomes because it is a continuous interval. Right? The time between nine and 10, we have infinitely many uh, time indexes. So because omega is infinite, we have to we have to put zero probability mass to every single outcome. Why? Because if you don't do that, if you put any arbitrary positive number, positive probability mass here, then because this omega has infinitely many possible outcomes, when you sum them up, it will become infinity. It violates the condition that you know, we must, all the probability mass must sum up to one. So this is the challenge here. Because omega is a continuous set, it has infinite numbers. So you have to you have to put zero probability mass to every single outcome. Therefore, you can. Therefore, what what we uh, what we can say is that. The probability that the bus arrives at a particular time between nine and ten is zero, okay. and this is uh, understandable because between nine and ten is a continuous interval. You can find infinitely many real numbers between them, right? So, and every every time can be hit equally likely. So the probability that you hit any particular time will be zero. This is still understandable. And then with this, we can start to calculate the probability uh, of those events. The probability of C, now what is event C? Let's go back. The C is that the bus arrives at this particular time. Okay, the bus arrives at 9.15. And because it is a single point on the between 9 and 10, so according to this probability law, we know that it is zero. Okay. The bus arrives 9.15 with probability zero. Because we have infinite and many outcomes. <clears throat> and this seems to be okay. Uh, because we simply because the interval is continuous. But then let's consider uh, probability of D. Um, if you go back, what is D? D means that the bus arrives between 9.30 and 10. Okay, it's the probability of this interval. And then this starts to, there, there's a confusion here. There's a confusion here. So according to the traditional probability theory, okay, the, in, in order to, to calculate the probability of this event, we just need to sum up all the probability mass associated with the outcomes involved in the, this event. And so, so the outcomes involved in, in this event is omega between 930 to 10. So that's so we are going to summing up all the P omega where omega is between 930 to 10. But the but the challenge here is that on one hand we know each omega is zero. Right? It is derived here. On the other hand, this summation is, uh, is not uh, well-defined because each P omega is zero, but we are summing up. Now between 9, 30 and 10, there are still there are infinitely many, many uh, possible 
outcomes because it's a continuous integral, right? So we are summing up zero over uh, infinitely uh, many uh, possible outcomes. So it is not clear from this definition how, how to assign the probability to this event D. Okay. But on the other hand, if you, if you intuitively look at this problem, the event means that the bus will arrive between 9.30 and 10, which occupies half of the time interval. So intuitively, intuitively we know we know that this PD must be one half, right? Because your bus can arrive at any time between nine and 10. And this event D says that considers the, all the cases where the bus arrives between 9.30 and 10, 9.30 is here. Okay. So intuitively, you know that it, is, it must be one half. It's the length of this event divided by the length of the entire time interval. But if you follow the traditional probability uh, theory framework, um, well, seems we have some issues with uh, with summing up dealing with infinite uh, many of uh, dealing with sets that contains infinite many of elements. So this is the issue of traditional uh, probability framework. It can only handle finite cases, cases with finite elements, and some simple. Later on, we will talk about in some simple infinite cases. For this continuous case, uh, it has a fundamental issue. Yeah. It's not clear how, how to justify uh, following the traditional probability theory framework. How do we come up? How do we, how can we get this one half result? Because everything, every single probability mass here is zero. And we are summing up infinitely many zeros. So nobody, it is not clear how to calculate this summation. And we can, uh, this is just one example. Uh, we can have so many other examples as long as they are continue, they involve some continuous stuff. Then we realize this traditional framework is not good enough to deal with all the important cases that are involved in the real life. So this motivates us to, uh, this motivates formal growth to develop the modern probability theory the model. So this mo motivates to develop an advanced probability theory that can work for both finite and the infinite discrete and continuous scenarios. Okay, uh, we will talk about this later, um, but I can, before that, I can first highlight the two, the key differences between the, this advanced modern probability uh, theory and the traditional probability theory. <clears throat> so the first uh, key point about the advanced probability theory is that uh, they define events, as we introduced before, they define events as subsets of this omega set, the set of all the outcomes. We call event as we call any subset of omega an event. And the second thing is the key. We assign probability to events. instead of outcomes. Later we will we will elaborate on this point uh, more clearly. 
but but since that in the traditional theory we can see that here we we assign the probability probabilities to every single outcome we first assign probabilities to each outcome and then to calculate the probability of events we just sum them up either in a uniform way or in a weighted way, depending on the distribution. But in the in the modern probability theory, we we assign the probabilities to, to events instead of the instead of the uh, each single outcome, and that can avoid the above technical issues that we mentioned in the continuous experiment. But before we formally introduce the modern probability theory, we need to, because uh, as, as we can see from all these examples, we need to deal with sets, right? The omega is a set of all the possible outcomes and the events are subsets of this omega set. So we have to deal with sets in everywhere in the probability theory. So before that, we need to review and review some fundamental uh, tools in mathematics to deal with sets. But before that, let's first review some, base, some basic elements of set theory. And for, for, for most of this, you should be um, very familiar with them. So the first thing is, uh, what is a set? Well, a set is a very general thing. It is a collection of objects and elements. Well, objects and elements can be, basically can be anything. Could be numbers, could be sentences, could be characters. Okay, so a set can, 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 can include anything, basically. And we define the empty set. We usually use this notation to denote the empty set. Right? The empty set means that it contains no elements. It's something like zero in the on the real line. Okay. And uh, besides the empty set, empty set, the other extreme case is the universal set. which contains all the elements of interest. Okay. Think about the real line could be the universal set for, for numbers, right? Because the real line contains every, every single real number. Okay, these are uh, very intuitive definitions, but, and then starting from now on, we can introduce some calculation rules for sets. And you, you probably are already familiar with those. So union the union of two sets, A and B, is denoted as a union B. Okay. So this set is a union of two sets. So basically you put all the elements uh, of from these two sets together. For example, 
give you an example. If A is two, three, five, and if B is one, two, six, okay. And then uh, A union B, they put all the possible, all the elements in that union set. And because two is repeated twice, we, so we, we, will, we only count one of them because they, they are the same elements. So it's one, two, three, five, six. That's the union of two sets. And on the other hand, so this union is, you know, mimics the addition of numbers, but they, but you know, they, are, they are very different, but you can, you can see the intuitively understand it in this way. And the uh, union, the other one is intersection. In the section, and similarly uh, from this example, we know A intersect B. Basically, you just find out the common elements uh, within these two sets, and common elements two, right? Two is here and here. So that's the intersection, intersection operation. Okay, we have a union, we have intersection, and we also need another rule called com complement. Complement of uh, the complement of a set A is denoted by A. We put a C in the superscript. A complement, which means subtracting A from the universal set. So intuitively, if this is omega and this is A, then the rest of the stuff is A complement. So subtracting A from the universal set gives the complement of A. Which is intuitive, right? Complement. And some other stuff we need is uh, mutually. So sets A1, A2, let's consider a sequence of sets, a bunch of sets. A1, A2, AN, these sets are called mutually exclusive. If, well, by intuitively, by mutually exclusive means that every single set is, should not be contained, should not have overlapping with another set, which means, you know, AI and AJ, their intersections empty. for any i not equal to j. Okay. So that's the intuition for mutually ex exclusive. Yes. This one? Yeah. Oh, that's i, sorry. This is this means for all for all i not equal to j. Okay. Right. For example, these are mutually exclusive sets. They have no overlapping with each other. And uh, the last 
element that we need is the partition. Okay. We need to consider partition of cells. So A1, A2, AN is a partition of set omega if the following two uh, conditions hold. First of all, A1, A2, AN, they are mutually exclusive. Okay, they, have, they have no intersection with each other. And second of all, their union gives this omega set. A simple illustrative figure is that if this is omega, then this is a partition. Each AI has no overlap with other uh, sets A, and they their union together gives the set omega. So if this holds, we call this A1 to AN, they form a partition of omega. It's like when you cut a cake into different pieces. That's a partition. So these are the computational rules that we will follow uh, when we talk about sets. Right? So basically these operations are basically um, either putting the elements together or finding out the common elements or dividing the elements of sets into different, uh, different set, subsets. Okay. So they are intuitive, but if you if you're not very familiar with the, all these operations, uh, Maybe from the homework, we will, we will have some homeworks uh, to practice on this. Okay, so these are the computation rules. And the, in addition to this, we also need to talk about the countability of set. Now, why do we want to look at accountability? Because we have seen in the in the bus arrival example, right? When we deal with when we deal with continuous cases, the traditional probability theory fails. And the the issue is that continuous, or when we talk about intervals. In fact, the intervals on the real line have a very complex structure, much more complex than what we can expect. And that structure is related to countability. Okay. So we have to have some understanding on this concept. So we call a set A, Again, these definitions, many of them are intuitive, but we just need to state them formally. A set A is called finite if the cardinality of A is finite. Cardinality means the number of elements in that set. Number of elements. Okay. So it means finite elements, let's say. Right. If you roll a dice, you have finite, finite number of possible outcomes. So there, the omega set 
is a finite set. We have finite outcomes. But what is more interesting is the infinite cases. And for the infinite cases, we have two different scenarios. A set A is called countably infinite. Okay. What is countably infinite? Intuitively, look at these two words. Intuitively, it means, first of all, it contains infinite elements, right? Because there's an infinite thing here. Now, the second thing, the countably means that you can count, you can still count this set in some way. Now, how do we define this count countability? We call this set countably infinite if Elements of A can be put into a one to one correspondence with natural numbers. But what is natural numbers? Natural numbers is zero, one, two, three, et cetera. Great. Well, this is intuitive because for natural numbers, right? Intuitively, we can count them zero, one, two, three, four, five. I can count it. So we define countability as if I can find a one to one correspondence or one to one mapping between the elements of A and the natural numbers. So I can use a link, I can use a line to connect every element of in A to a unique element in the natural number. If that is the case, then we say it's countable. It is countable. I'll give you two examples. Uh, the, the set of natural number is countable. Why? Because I can simply I write why I write out I write down the set of natural numbers. And I can I can create a one-one correspondence uh, between the set of natural numbers to itself. Right? I simply connect it. So this is a one-one correspondence. So the natural number is countable. Uh, the second example is the set of even numbers. So let's write down the even numbers. Zero, two, four, six, eight, ten. Right. And this is also countable. So, so first of all, it is infinite, right? Because we have infinite even numbers. Now, second of, second, second of all, I claim it is countable because I can build a one-one correspondence between the even numbers and natural numbers. So this is the correspondence. Now, more, more precisely, uh, every even number can be written as two times k, right? Well, k starts from zero, one, two, three, four, five. Well, this is the expression for even number. Is two times the k. Well, k can range from 
where k can take any values of natural numbers. So this is a natural one-one co correspondence between even number and uh, natural number. So every even number can be written as two times a natural number k. And then I will assign this even number to the natural number k. Okay. This, is a, this is a unique assignment and it's one to one. Right, this is, this is, for example, this is two times one, this is two times two, two times three, two times four, two times five. So this K, I can assign, the, I can <clears throat> connect every even number to a unique uh, natural number. Okay. So this is a one-one correspondence. If you can build this one-one correspondence, then you can say this set is countably, countably infinite. You can count it because you have a one-one correspondence to natural numbers and you can count those natural numbers. Okay. And in fact, from here, you can claim that uh, the, the, the number of even numbers is the same as the number equals to the number of natural numbers. Although, although the number of even numbers can, is contained in the set of natural numbers. But because we can build a one-one correspondence, and the both sets are infinite. So, so you can claim they both of them have the same number of elements and both and uh, <clears throat> which is infinity. Okay, so this sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but you, if you think about it clearly, because both of them are infinite, right? If you if you consider finite uh, even numbers within a finite interval, of course. The number of even numbers is always less than one half the number of natural numbers. But if you consider the entire set of even numbers, uh, both of them are inf inf both of them are inf uh, infinite. And because you can build this one-one -on correspondence, so you can say, okay, now for every even number, I can find a unique natural number to 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 associate with it. So. This is a one-one correspondence, so they must have the same cardinality. Okay, this is how we precisely deal with infinity in mathematics. Okay, so now we have this countably infinite. We, we must have another case, which is called uncountably infinite. So how do we define that? We call the set uncountably infinite if it is not countably infinite. Okay, very tricky definition. Uh, okay. If a set A is not countably infinite, then we call it, is, we call it uncountably infinite. Now, what is an example of uncountably infinite set? Well, The numbers between zero and one is uncountably infinite, right? Because you cannot find a one-one correspondence to the natural numbers. A, 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 a informal and uh, an informal argument would be Think about this, if you start from zero, and if you, if you want to count this set, the elements in this set, what is the next number that you want to say? You cannot find it, right? So it is not 0 0.1 because you have a smaller number between them, between zero and, and 0 0.1. 
So you cannot count this set. But this argument is not rigorous. It is not 100% uh, correct. But this gives you an intuition. Okay, what is, roughly speaking, what is uncountably infinite? So we need this, we need all these concepts because in the modern probability theory, we have to deal with continuous cases, right? Now the simplest continuous case is an interval, right? Bus arrival between zero, nine and 10 is a continuous interval. So we have to understand the structures of the intervals at least. Okay. So about countability, we have uh, finite, which is the simplest case. Uh, and the, the, the traditional probability theory works perfectly for the finite case. Okay. Countably infinite, which is uh, uh, a still simple case because if it's countably infinite, then we can find a one-one correspondence to natural numbers. So there's a very simple structure here. And the rest, the, the 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 rest of the case is uncountably infinite, which is the most challenging case that we need to deal with. Okay, so these are the definitions. And the last one, okay, the, the last definition uh, that we will talk about in set theory is the power set. We call uh, the power set of A, okay, for any set A, its power set is denoted as, I will use this notation to denote the power set, zero one to the power of A. Now this is just a notation. What, what it means is that which is the set of all subsets of A. Okay. All the possible subsets of A. For example, let's consider this set A. <clears throat> and then uh, let's write down this power set. There's a reason that we write, uh, we denote power set as using this notation, because to construct a power set of a set A, we simply need to consider every element. So, okay, how to construct, how to, how to get all the subsets of a set A? Well, you basically consider every element in A and uh, do a binary decision. Do I want to include this element in the subset or not? Okay. And all the combinations of these binary decisions will give us a subset. Okay. For example, uh, this set A has three elements. Uh, let me write it here. Maybe it's a different color. Okay, A has three elements. And um, <clears throat> we just need to for every element, we just need to do a binary decision. Should, do I need to include this element in the subset or not? And because every element will have a binary decision, so we will have in total two to the power of three cases. 
So the first case is that I do not include any element in the subset. So that will give me the empty set. Okay. And we know empty set is a subset of A. Okay, so you write empty set here. That's the first case. And then you just go over all the possible combina binary combinations. Okay. This, um, okay, I'm gonna use cross. Okay. So this gives me the element, uh, this subset, which contains only the element one, okay? And you can, right, you can do it. I will not go over all the, maybe I can. Uh, so this one, this two, three, and the other one is this. And this. And this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have it. We have one more. Okay, I think I get it. It's this one. Right. And then you can write down the corresponding uh, subset. It's a subset. One, two. Okay. So you can do it by yourself. So this is why uh, we we denote it as zero one to the power of a. It's like every element in a zero one means two, right? So this this power set has two to the power of a number of uh, elements. Every element is a subset of a. So going over all the combinations, this is the power set of a. Basically, every single element in this power set is a subset of A. Right, so the, there are in total eight elements. It's two to the power of three, right? They, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight elements. <clears throat> okay, so this is everything I want to say about the basic uh, basics of set theory before we talk about the modern probability theory. So uh, are there any questions about all these materials? Yeah, so in the, in the set theory, we talked about the basic operations of, uh, on the sets, right? You, uh, intersection, union, uh, complement, these are the three basic uh, operations. And then we define what is mutually ex exclusive, what is a partition, these are definitions. And the important concept about set is the countability of set, right? We have finite set, countably infinite and uncountably infinite. So this, each category has a different structure. and the, the power set. Okay, for the last uh, 12 minutes, I can briefly talk about the, the structure of the modern probability theory. So for the traditional, probability theory, we have seen, we have seen from the bus arrival example that 
directly assigning probabilities to outcomes. will cause a problem. And the problem occurs whenever we have infinite, okay, count, uncountably infinite outcomes. Okay. <clears throat> by the bus arrival between 9 and 10, this interval, omega, has uncountably infinite uh, elements. So this causes a problem. If we, if we want to assign probabilities directly to outcomes, this will uh, cause a problem. So what modern probability theory suggests is to assign probabilities to events. Instead of outcomes. Now what is event? Event is a subset. Omega. We will formally define this later. Okay. So the traditional probability assigns probability mass to every every single element in omega. Okay. But in the modern probability theory, uh, we assign probability to the subsets of omega. So if we if I draw a picture to illustrate the difference. This is what traditional probability theory look like. We have a omega set. And in this omega set, we have uh, many outcomes. Every outcome is one element. And what we do is that for every outcome, um, I will assign a probability mass. And this probability mass is between zero and one. Right. Assign a value between zero and one to this possible outcome. And similar for omega two. And omega three. Okay, so we assign we assign this mass to every single element in the omega set, and this causes an issue when there are uncountably infinite many uh, points in this omega set. Well, the modern probability theory assigns probabilities to events, which is a subset of omega. So for every subset, <clears throat> for every event, right? event is a subset of the omega, right? So for every event, I assign a probability, I call it PA, 
probability of this event, uh, which is between zero and one. Now, going back to the bus arrival example, uh, right? So this is, so when we assign, when we try to assign probabilities to every outcome, then when we calculate this probability of this event, we, we encounter this issue, right? We cannot deal with summation of zeros over infinitely many terms. So this is not well-defined, but instead, we directly assign a probability to this event. Okay, we directly assign one half to the probability of this event, right? Because we know that uh, this event corresponds to the interval between nine thirty to ten, which has measure one over two. Right, it, it occupies one half of the interval. So the so. So by directly assigning probability mass to the events, we can avoid uh, this uh, this difficult okay, and make the entire framework consistent, self consistent. And these different probabilities stay um, okay. Here we require that this probability mass is sum up to one. Right, because it is a single, uh, every, every one corresponds to the probability mass of a single element, single outcome. Summing them up, you must give the probability one. But in the modern framework, because we are assigning probabilities to sets, not every single outcome. So the probability here is a, we are satisfied a set of different conditions. So uh, briefly, we will, we will write, formally write them, uh, formally introduce them later, but briefly it will satisfy this. Yeah, so, so I will uh, formally introduce them later, but here we are only talking, we are only concern, cons considering the probability of the events. So in the ex extreme case, if the event is the entire uh, omega, omega outcome space, then the probability uh, of this omega must be one because every outcome is included in omega. So, so this will happen with probability one. And empty is an empty event, so it happens with probability zero. Okay, this should be zero. And the, uh, besides these two, we also need a set of other conditions that we will talk about later. Right. So this is the high level structure, a structural difference between traditional and the modern probability theory. Okay. So in the modern theory, we assign probabilities to events. And uh, how to assign this probability depends on your experiment, depends on how you, how you describe your experiment. Right? If you are rolling a, a failed, a failed dice, then you have a particular probability law associated with uh, that experiment. We will uh, we will see that by going over more examples in the in the next lecture. Okay, so I think I will uh, stop here, and uh, you can start it to work on. You can start to work on the homework one. I think uh, both problems are related to the sets and the set theory, so you can start to work on that. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to come to the office hours or send me an email. Okay, I will see you guys on uh, next Tuesday.
and uh, come to the classroom if you like.